Guy, thanks so much for um, taking the invitation and coming um, uh, to uh, present uh, <clears throat> some of the recent work that you're, uh, you've been doing. Um, to uh, whoever has not uh, heard of uh, or seen <laughs> Guy, uh, <clears throat> Guy's work, um, uh, let me just, uh, uh, you can read the, the bio uh, uh, in the email that we sent, but uh, let me just point out uh, two uh, interesting things. Uh, Guy is currently uh, heading the Human Robot Collaboration and Companionship Lab at Cornell. And uh, uh, one interesting thing that I found is that they actually have a mission to the lab. Uh, so the lab is at Cornell, very nice place, uh, the super, um, the, one of the best universities uh, in the world. Uh, and their mission is, and I'm reading, our mission is to understand the complex interplay between human behaviors, attitudes and needs, and personal robotic techniques uh, technologies in order to design robots that best support human values. Um, I think that uh, the challenge that they've taken on themselves is re re very representative of Guy's uh, work and his bio biography and academic career. He spans uh, knowledge from AI, uh, psychology, music, and the arts. Um, is a real, uh, obviously, computer science and robotics. Uh, he's a real uh, renaissance man in that sense. Um, and um, um, I hope everybody enjoys uh, the work he's going to present today. And I'm going to stop here. Guy, again, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try. It's always a, a challenge with updates to get the presentation right. I'm going to try and see if I can get this to work. Um, with a share screen, so to give me some some real real time feedback. Um, I try and do is uh, share my whole screen, then switch here. So, do you guys see my title slide right now? Perfect. And you you don't see my my like presenter display, you see the full screen title. Um, your head is uh, on the right uh, bottom corner. Okay. Yeah, it's not in the presenter. presenter. All right, so I want to talk to you. So thanks again for the invitation. I've actually, you know, I've, I've, um, so when you sent me the email, I, I looked a little bit at the lab and I realized that I've actually um, already in the past seen some of your work um, at the different conferences and it was I, I it stood out to me even then especially what I, what I just mentioned the fact that you can sort of take technology and take the questions that you're interested in and really implement them in real world situations there's um, a huge gap between research and implementation I feel um, that goes across you know, the biggest companies and uh, uh, departments and all the way to even smaller, you know, labs that are, that are testing different uh, ideas. But then, you know, somehow the the, the gap, bridging the gap into reality is has always escaped uh, academia a little bit. So it's really impressive that you are able to uh, <clears throat> to to make that you know that um, leap in a way that's really meaningful and um, taught me a lot to learn from that. Um, my uh, uh, university uh, office is on, on, the, on the Cornell campus, which you can see here, which is a beautiful hilltop campus uh, overlooking a, a lake. You know, when I walk to work, back when I used to walk to work, you know, I would pass waterfalls. And so it's a very um, um, quiet and peaceful place, although, you know, many months of the year, including now, it looks more like this. So it's, uh, it's cold and uh, storming um, obviously the last year has been has been very uh, strange and uh, di difficult we haven't been on campus much our, our research was moved online uh, teaching has moved mostly online or, or mixed remotely so uh, hopefully we will be able to reconnect with uh, with our community and campus soon I actually started out with this with this uh, lab mission I've, I've seen this um, uh, Daniel Woods uh, researcher at MIT 
had uh, had to give it gave a talk and started with her last mission. I thought, well, this is great. Well, my lab doesn't have a mission, so um, this is relatively new, and it really helps us define what types of research we're interested in, and it also talks a little bit. I mean, this doesn't talk about methodology so much. I have another sort of slide about methodology, um, which, uh, but the lab's mission is really trying to understand um, human behaviors, attitudes, and needs, and the relationship to, to personal robots, and personal robots could be at work or at home, um, and with the goal that um, to design robots that best support human values. And this is also uh, the topic of today's talk, which is based on the number one question that uh, I'm getting as a robotics researcher, and especially as a human robot interaction researcher, um, top search in my, in my questions that I get after my talks, will robots take my job? Other very variations, you know, will there be any jobs left after robots you know, get implemented in the workforce? Um, <clears throat> will robots eliminate all the jobs? What will I do when a robot does my job? Who, what will people work in? And the answer to this is really, I think it's complicated. You know, this is, um, um, there's no quick answer to this. Generally, it's very hard to predict the future, but uh, um, I will try and, and uh, give my perspective from uh, the research that I see in human robot interaction around me and also uh, share with you a little bit of the research we've been doing that has shed light on, the, on how complicated this question really is. Um, and one thing is for sure, I mean, this question is on everybody's mind. Um, you can see here, you know, a sp special session by the World Economic Forum, which is a, a place where, you know, the leaders of politics and, and the industry and uh, economic research come together. And there was a, a few years ago, a whole, you know, the whole topic of the meeting, the annual meeting was the human robot workforce and how uh, humans and robots uh, need to work together or should work together. And in a way, this has been a sort of um, the focus of my own research over the last 15 years. Um, I've been moving around a lot within the field of human robot interaction, which is, uh, um, I will often refer to it here as HRI, human robot interaction. Um, I've worked uh, in, on, on the AI related to HRI. I've worked on um, design questions. Um, I've worked a lot on, on robotic companions for the home. And, uh, but most recently, I've been interested more on this question of the robots in the workforce, um, which, is, uh, which has been sort of my focus uh, more recently. I also want to say that if you want to ask any question at any point, I'll be happy to to divert to a specific topic, to give more details, to answer any questions you might have, even if these questions are associative and you just, it just makes you think of something that you want to discuss and in no way, um, you know, attached to the specific uh, trajectory of, of this talk. And I don't, you know, want the, the, the preparation and the slides to be leading what otherwise could be a more motivated discussion. Um, the bottom line of what I will try to say today, and this sort of ties back to the lab mission, is that um, a lot of times we think about this question, will robots take my job, as a technological economic question. So technological meaning, um, can robots do a certain job? And an economic question is, is it efficient or useful for the economy or for the employer or for the employee? to have a robot do this particular job. Um, but I think the real prism that we should all take to ask, answering, answering this question uh, should be a question of values. I think every time we want to think about robots in the workplace, we want to think about what this means about the humans involved in this, in this, um, in this workplace. So I want to start, so the first maybe half of the talk will be trying to give you an overview of like what people in HRI in my field of research are thinking about, what are the big um, topics, what are the big challenges. Um, and each of the application areas, um, I will tell you what I think is pretty easily solved these days and or will be easily solved and what is still a hard challenge that we don't have good solutions for. Um, this is an, uh, a few years ago, The Economist, uh, the British uh, journal, uh, 
magazine had a special issue, The Rise of the Robots, and their, their title page, this is the image on the title, it kind of shows the, the, the types of um, the types of applications that people are thinking about when they are um, thinking about where robots would come in. And you can see robots that are making deliveries, uh, robots that uh, take care of the elder uh, population, uh, robots that take care of children. And um, we will talk about a lot of these, and then we will also talk about uh, robots at work. And specifically, we'll talk about uh, the work that I'm doing at the end, uh, which is robots that are what I think really the, the biggest frontier of, of the human robot workforce, which is creative work, research work, and the types of work where we think that robots might be uh, intuitively not have a big role because we think of robots as physical labor. Um, and I, I think that at the end, hopefully, you will think about the human robot workforce through a slightly different uh, perspective. Uh, first, I, uh, I hope you will think about this through the lens of uh, what are humans really good at? Like, what are humans good at? What, what do we excel in compared to machines? And second, um, how do we want society to look like? And do robots in a, in a specific work support that, uh, that goal? Let's start with, uh, with an overview of where robots are, are going according to the research, uh, the academic research in robotics. I generally think about these as uh, three, three areas. So people, people are doing research that will place robots um, in the homes. Uh, other um, people are thinking about uh, putting robots in public spaces like uh, shopping malls and air, airports or train stations. And the third is uh, people are thinking about robots in uh, the workplace. Um, Robots in the Homes was a huge um, research effort and, and in the late 2010s, so starting in 2015 and through the rest of the, the last decade, um, there were a lot of companies uh, that were um, producing products that would put robots uh, in homes. Here you can see a Jibo, which is a, a startup by my own PhD advisor, Cynthia Brazil. Uh, and uh, the use cases um, were you know helping with uh, cooking, so but it was mostly like a social interaction. So the robot could read you out a recipe, or um, you can talk to the robot to order something from a restaurant, um, or ask the robot to take photos or tell stories to children. And um, at the end of the last decade, so 2019 or so, a lot of these companies uh, shut down, and there was a kind of a huge crisis around this question. We've done 10, 15 years of research on robotic companions. Um, and then there were you know, a dozen, if not more companies that actually made this into a product, including with the you know, latest technology. And then within two or three or four years, all of these companies uh, shut down and went bankrupt. And the question really brought up, the question that this brought up is, why do we need robots in the home at all? Like, do we need them in the home? And I think the biggest question with this this area of research is really the question of a, of a use case. Like, well, what is what are robots good at? In, in some sense, um, the appearance of uh, voice uh, um, agents in in these like smart speakers like Amazon Echo, Google Home, Facebook Portal, and these types of speakers, uh, they kind of went to the same use cases but without the robotic component. And, and many many people think that this was one of the reasons why. Um, these companies did not succeed, but uh, in a sort of ironic twist, the latest version of Amazon Echo now has uh, at least one motor that moves the, the screen around and, 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 and what goes back to this use case of, um, I want to call it like attention of the, of the, the smart speaker agent. We do have sort of um, existing robot technology in the home. Uh, robotic vacuum cleaners are um, Kind of came out of nowhere. I think the, the, they've been a solid uh, consumer product uh, that took robotic technology, like uh, you know, laser scanning and uh, navigation algorithms, and brought it to a very uh, uh, useful use case. Uh, and, and this is kind of like a curious situation in terms of um, technology because we have 
one example of a technology that really went from research into a consumer product. And then this happened maybe 10 years ago, if not more. And since then, you know, nothing, nothing else, you know, there have been advances in, in robotic chefs that can, you know, help you cook and cut uh, vegetables or you know, stir things, but none of these really became a product. Um, the, the largest research effort has to do with, uh, um, in the home, is, is has to do with robots um, for uh, the older population. And uh, this can be physical assistance, like grabbing something from a, from a high shelf and bringing it to, to a person or, uh, or just uh, companion robotics, like uh, this robot on the right called LEQ from a company called uh, Intuitive, Intuition Robotics or Intuitive Robotics, I always forget. Um, and so I, either helping the older population with uh, physical tasks or helping them to overcome loneliness. And here, um, the question of values comes up very clearly. Like, what does it mean to help, uh, to have a technology or a robot to help an older person uh, overcome loneliness? This, uh, um, this question of, of loneliness uh, um, isn't just for uh, older adults. Here on the right, you can see uh, an example of a robot that's supposed to uh, hold your hand so you feel the tactile connection uh, to something or I don't want to call this someone but to, to something and immediately I hope in, in your minds there are a lot of questions like what, 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 do, we, what do we become as a society when we outsource the care to our parents and grandparents to a technology. Um, people on the other side of this debate will say, you know, the reality right now is that there's just a lot of loneliness, a lot of people are living alone. Uh, but immediately, this does not become a question of technology, but a question of, of, uh, of human values. Um, we did a study a few years ago uh, where we interviewed uh, older adults and we showed them different robotic technology, both existing. We showed them some startup companies and we showed them research projects. And um, one of the conclusions was that they want the robots to be, you know, kind of as small as and uninterfering as possible. And there was a lot of worry that robots will, um, first of all, they, they will feel like fake and it's a fake technology. And second, that they will um, make them lose abilities and lose the control over their own lives. So, so when you talk to, to, to the target population, not from a very convinced techno solutionist perspective, but really talking to them about, about, the, about the values. Um, the, these social robots uh, for elder care uh, become a very um, debated or very um, controversial technology. Mirroring this, again, we have uh, quite a bit of research in HRI that looks at, um, at robots for child care. Um, so, um, in some uh, scenarios, we talk about uh, uh, robots as babysitters, and uh, I often like it's very hard on Zoom because I don't see you. And uh, um, but when I have a, when I talk in a real room, then I ask people like, how many people would, would want to give their child to a robotic babysitter, and why, and well, why not? Um, and I think there this also you know very often people say we can. It's not just about watching the child; it's also about giving the child you know, experiences of social interaction with another person and you can, and if you, you can't really have this type of uh, connection with a robot or you shouldn't have this type of connection with a robot. Um, other examples of robots for childcare, um, uh, there's quite a bit, bit of research that looks at the robots on the autism spectrum and uh, their connection with, with robots that uh, in, in many studies is shown to be more successful than their connection with other humans. Um, and uh, the third uh, sort of the, uh, path of, uh, of uh, robots with children has to do with, uh, with teaching. So robots um, supplementing on-screen tutorials. Um, and, and again, we had this huge experiment now. I don't know what, what it was like you know, in your area, but, um, but in many schools here, children started learning online and, and in some way we, we learned that this big promise that has been um, on our minds for so long to have you know, remote teaching and children can, they can learn from video, uh, the result was that we really learned that school is about much more than just getting lectures and doing exercises. Uh, and overall, 
I would say that from many from many perspectives, this idea of virtual teaching has been uh, um, has not been a success. Um, all of these together, uh, again, this is more a question of a discussion, but uh, but all these together, this idea of of, of caring for the older uh, the older population or caring for children raises what I in a, in a recent paper called the social uncanny and the uncanny is a is a, an effect from you know early 20th century psychology um, that talks about the sense of eeriness the sense of un discomfort with robotic technology with technology sorry the uncanny is not about robotic technology. the uncanny is about a general, you know, sense of, of unease and worry and fear, um, and then in the in the 1970s, people brought this into robotics technology that said that you know if robots look very human-like, they become uncanny, they become you know in some sense creepy. Um, and in this recent paper, I was I, I was talking about this idea of the social uncanny that we ha also have an, a discomfort about certain social relationships that robots have. Um, like uh, caring for the older adults or, or caring for our children, and that this uncanny has to do with the with the the roles that robots maybe should not take uh, in society. Um, the last uh, um, and possibly most uh, promising area is robots for entertainment and game playing. So here you can see uh, research from Anna Paiva's lab in, in Portugal that looks at robots uh, playing a card game with people using a tablet. Uh, on the right is a robot from my own research that was uh, sort of a music and video watching companion that reacted with you to the content that you that you consume. And and perhaps entertainment is uh, is the right way to think about robots in the home when we think about this as, as another entertainment technology. Um, where there's not so much a question of a, of a, a social, an inappropriate social relationship. In terms of uh, hard research problems that we have with uh, robots that are um, um, that are in in homes, uh, the biggest problem is really emotion modeling. Um, there's a lot of research trying to detect uh, emotions in uh, in humans and react to them. Uh, these are Again, they work for very limited cases, but they don't really work uh, in a general sense. Um, I always say, you know, people people are surprised that emotion modeling is, is so hard for robots, but uh, I think it's pretty hard for humans too. If if, uh, if we were good at emotion modeling, we probably wouldn't have uh, as many divorces as we have in, in between humans. Um, the second is long-term engagement. How can we make a robot move from um, being a gimmick, being sort of a one-time, one-off, interesting idea? In the home uh, to something that's really mean, has a meaningful role in the in the home and the family over a longer period of time, and and, and I think there there are not a lot of good solutions. Um, there's um, um, I think one of the things we should think about is looking at other types of narrative technologies and narrative entertainment formats and try to to model some of these for uh, uh, for robotics. And then finally, a lot of people are thinking are looking at this idea of reliability and trust, and, and, and this ties in with this question of long-term engagement. Um, so the, the next, uh, um, and I'm going to sort of briefly uh, go over, uh, or maybe this point up if there are any questions or any comments that you want to um, raise about robots in the homes. Things maybe we can do it again, if that's OK. Sure. I'm, I'm, so I'll, uh, uh, I don't see the Zoom window, so if anything comes up there, it's best if you just use unmute and use your voice because I have the way that the presentation is set up, I only see my presentation. Um, so the second um, area that, we are, um, that we're thinking about is uh, robots in public spaces. And, um, and here, um, the main sort of application that people are thinking about is, is um, uh, on the right, you can see security robots that have been implemented quite a bit uh, around uh, companies and campuses in the U.S. And uh, personally, I find them to be very disturbing. Um, they're generally controlled from a from a control room, and they uh, um, are some sort of like mobile remote cameras. And then you have robots that are more used for marketing, 
in uh, shopping malls and, uh, and in, in these, uh, this example, you can see a robot that's at a shop front trying to bring in customers. Um, other examples are um, robots in museums, sort of tour guides. Uh, we think uh, we look at uh, um, there's quite a bit of research that looks at, the, at tour guides of robots helping um, uh, helping people find certain parts of the exhibition or explaining parts of the exhibition. And here, this could be an interesting sort of technology that, that is in between a kiosk and a, an information kiosk and uh, a sort of like a guide. Uh, but then again, think, we also need to think, okay, I'm going to tie this back into this question of values. Um, what kind of, what do we, what do we um, present to our, the public when we say that we want robots um, that are securing a certain area and you, and you have an interaction with a robot rather with a, with a, 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 a security personnel or, or what is your experience from having a tour guide at a museum or at a historic place uh, is it really just about the information? Is it also about you know meeting an expert and being able to ask them questions? And similarly, uh, we have um, uh, the security robots implemented in shopping malls on the left. Uh, this is in, in Australia, um, or uh, robot tour guides that are implemented in, in transit stations like airports. And here, the hard problems are moving around in crowds and trying to understand how crowds move. Um, and also interacting with a large group of people in a way that makes sense. And it turns out that interacting with more than one person is much more difficult than interacting with one person. Uh, and these are the biggest uh, research questions. I'm going to keep this relatively short because I want to I want to move into the main topic of this uh, of this presentation, which is uh, robots in the workplace. Now, for some uh, workers, um, they've been working with robots for for a while now. I mean, the, the Three biggest areas of where robots have been um, implemented in, in human contexts is uh, in space exploration, and there mostly robots are remote. And here you can see the Mars rover on the left, um, and the humans that are interacting with them are on the ground um, or in the space station. Uh, surgery has uh, had a lot of success with robotics, especially uh, the Da Vinci robot. Um, but uh, which uh, which has been used in surgery for for many years now uh, and and very successfully and here the interaction with, is with a, the surgeon and in the military you know mostly bump disposal robots or other types of uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles uh, so what's common to these uh, these workplaces and and i'm going to sort of like end here with this part is that uh, the robots are designed for very highly trained personnel. So if you're you know, working for NASA or you're working in, a, in an operating room or you're working for the military, you've received a lot of training uh, to be able to, to do your job. And therefore, uh, I, I, call them, I call them sort of like uh, robots for specialized, uh, highly trained workers. And here, and in this case, we've seen that the robots can be, can be uh, extremely useful and, and, um, and really take part of the job that it's very hard for humans to do like getting close to a bomb, getting to Mars, or being very precise about a surgical procedure. Um, <clears throat> the second place where we see uh, quite a bit of, ro of robotics is in uh, manufacturing and logistics. And here on the right, you see a, a car a factory. And uh, we've visited a car factory recently, actually, uh, just on a, on a trip to Detroit. Um, and it's surprising to see how little robots are able to do in car manufacturing. You usually see these, like, images or video clips, you're like, oh, cars are being built by robots. And again, I, I, if we could have a, a more face-to-face -face discussion, I would, I would ask you, what, how many of, of the operations to build a car do you think are being done by robots? And, uh, and many think that it's you know, at least 50%, if not 80%. But really, robots do exactly three things in the car factory. And, and most, and these are you know, welding, painting, and inspecting. Uh, and almost all of the operations that need to, to, to have any sort of, you know, flexibility, precision, and ma manipulation are all done by humans. You know, cars are mostly built by humans still, and the same goes for airplanes. And the second uh, area um, is, um, um, is on the left, where you can see these robotic shelves that are being used in Amazon's warehouse. Uh, and these shelves are... are um, are these like swarm robotic uh, technology that, that brings the shelf to the worker. Um, and this has also been a very uh, successful example of implementing uh, uh, 
sort of research level robotics into the workplace. Um, and you can also see the division between what the robot does and what the human does here. So, so the robot um, can navigate, but all the packing, so this, so what, what's happening in this warehouse is, is that people are packing up packages for Amazon. Um, but all the like getting something out of a shelf and into a box is very simple procedure, it still has to be done by, by a human. And here, I want to tie this back again to this question of values. One of the, the largest criticisms about, the, about this implementation uh, of robotics is that it put a lot of pressure on the human worker to be as fast as the robot can bring the items. Um, but then you can say, well, we're just making the, the work for the human more efficient. They don't have to walk to the shelf and go back. But if you think that this is what Amazon has in mind, I think this needs to be reevaluated because if you look at what Amazon has been doing since their warehouses have become so heavily in brand robotics, is to invest all of their research in this last part of grasping something out of a shelf. You can see the shelf on the right. Um, and the uh, uh, research robot in, in the so-called Amazon Grasping Challenge, which they have funded many, many university labs to try to solve. Um, and my guess is that uh, Amazon is completely trying to move for to uh, uh, total robotic um, warehouse. And here we have to ask ourselves these questions. So on one hand, this means that the last bit that was this done by humans um, is also being replaced by robotics. But on the other hand, humans in these Amazon warehouses have been you know, consistently being reported to suffer from horrible working conditions. Um, and so maybe this is actually a better outcome for the, for the uh, for the human workers. Uh, but these are really the questions you need to ask. And finally, we're looking at the service industry. It's the largest industry in the US. Um, and on the left, you can see a healthcare robot, which uh, helps, which is similar to the Amazon uh, robot, but it's on a much smaller scale. So this brings, this robot on the left brings uh, medication and equipment to, uh, uh, to nursing stations and from, uh, from different areas of the hospital to different other areas. On the right, you can see a robot that's uh, already commercially used in grocery stores. Um, where the robot is um, um, monitoring shelves, finding where things are missing, uh, looking for spills on the on the ground, and calling people to to uh, um, to solve this problem. So uh, you can see another place of interface where you have uh, where you have one uh, uh, the robot and the humans work together. So the robot cannot restock the shelves, so the robot can tell you where the stocks need to, where the shelves need to be restocked. Um, and also the, the robot maybe cannot clean up different types of spills, but they can detect them and call the humans. And then we're getting into this uh, question, like who is really the boss of who? Like does the robot tell the human what to do or does the robot help the human do, do their job? I want to talk about uh, a little bit of a different line of work, which is, um, uh, here you can see it from, from an article in Wired a few years ago, a robot therapist. And, uh, and in my lab, we've actually uh, thought a little bit about this question of robots interviewing people and robots hearing people's stories. Uh, this is a, a concept sketch uh, that you can see here of a, of a robot uh, recording uh, the life stories of a person and sort of uh, keeping these for the family or for future uh, reference. Uh, and we, we did a study um, a few years back with uh, Gorit Birnbaum at, uh, at IDC Herzliya, where I was uh, working. And we had this robot that was this music listening robot on the left, uh, listen to people's um, <clears throat> personal stories and uh, mostly people's sort of traumatic or negative uh, experience stories. And we were manipulating in this study what type of uh, feedback the robot gives the person. So on one hand, the robot can give the person the what I would call the, the, the stereotypical male feedback, which is, you know, don't worry, it's not, not such a big deal. You know, I mean, this, you, I, there's bigger problems in the world than, than what you're telling me. And on that hand, we, gave, we had the robot give uh, psychologically appropriate or so-called responsive feedback where the robot would, would listen, would nod. And every once in a while, the robot would say a generic sentence like, uh, that sounds like a very difficult experience, or I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this, couldn't have been easy for you. Uh, so it's sort of like generic responsive uh, res uh, um, feedback. And we found that even though the feedback was very generic and it was not based at all on any sort of artificial intelligence, 
people who got this responsive or psychologically appropriate feedback uh, came out of this experience as more confident and more likely to want to spend more time with the robot or to take the robot with them to stressful experiences. And uh, whether we tested this is actually interesting. So this all this protocol comes from my collaboration with, uh, with the uh, social psychologists I work with. Um, we had people then record a dating, a dating video, so a video for a dating website, and ask them how attractive they think they were and how likely somebody would rate them highly on the dating website. And this is sort of a, a measure for, for confidence. And, and this is what we used to, to measure how the robots respond to affecting people's confidence. Uh, but uh, as sort of like an aside, when the press kind of picked this up, uh, you know, they thought the interesting thing was that robots make people more confident when they're going on dates. Um, so this was a very unrelated headline that we got uh, after this research. The research was really about listening to people. And there's like an interesting um, outcome for this. So here you can see uh, an idea of uh, robotic lawyers talking to refugees, asking them questions, recording their answers. And this brought us to, to think about really this question of robots being used um, for interviewing people who might not want to be interviewed by real people. And, and, and the main point is that uh, in some cases, people might feel judgment. So if you're a victim, for example, of sexual assault, or if you're a refugee and you, you, know, you might not have all your documents uh, quite in order, you might worry that the person would judge you or would, um, would uh, um, put you in a, in a compromising situation, but you might be more likely to talk to a robot about, uh, about a, a problem. And this, on one hand, it could be that the robot can give the person confidence to actually share the information that's, that's necessary. On the other hand, there's also the question of, you know, isn't this some sort of a manip like emotional manipulation? Is it not just another way to get people to share more of their lives with technology? So after this, um, um, this sort of overview, um, you might be now somewhat depressed and feel like, okay, so, so robots are going to be everywhere and it doesn't seem to be like such a great situation and humans will be out of jobs. So if you talk to robotics researchers, they will tell you, no, it's the opposite. We will just make robots help people. So the sort of headline for many research grant applications and for many research projects, you know, robots are not going to replace people. It's not going to be instead of people, together with people, you know, people would be more empowered to to do their job, and, and this is, you know, from academia through, you know, government to the press. This is the story that we're being told, and you know, I myself obviously have said this many times when I was you know, trying to get a new project off the ground. But I want to be a little bit skeptical here, you know, from from today's perspective, and say that it's, you know, it's really is more complicated. When we look at, at recent research, this is from uh, I think two years ago, out of uh, MIT and Boston University. Um, we can see that the studying, you know, where robots are slowly going into workplaces, um, there's a, a detectable decrease in employment and there's more unemployment in the cutting counties where robots are more used. And this effect is also almost like, a, you know, the butterfly effect um, that spreads globally. This very recent um, um, research called U.S. Robots and the Impact in the Tropics uh, shows that uh, in industries that were, where the U.S. has adopted more robotics uh, to gain back the competitive advantage, there was a larger amount of factory closures in Colombia, which was supplying the same types of um, products to the U.S. before. So we can we not even, we don't even have to just think about you know our our national labor market or anything about robotics. We also need to think about the global labor market because. Um, but we can see that this, it can even affect labor markets in other countries because of the interconnected um, nature of the global economy. And, um, and finally, um, you know, remember the travel agents, if you're as old as I am, you know, I, when I finished my high school, I went to a travel agent to get a ticket to Europe and, you know, travel around, uh, around Europe. Um, we can see that if we just, uh, um, uh, let the technology and economy take its take its route. The travel agents are not being more. We, we're not made more efficient by uh, by uh, uh, travel technology, but really there's no travel agents anywhere anymore. Almost, 
and I think when you think about why does quite a companies like Google and Uber and Lyft uh, study autonomous uh, cars, it's not because they want uh, Uber drivers to have an easier, li an easier life. I think it's uh, pretty clear that they are interested in eliminating the driver, which is one of the biggest cost factors from, from the ecosystem. So in my so going back to uh, to um, uh, to the overarching question is you know this question of will robots take my job if we leave this to a purely economical or uh, an economic or technological question I think that the trend will always be in the same direction so, you know more robots used wherever possible um, and less human labor and. Even when they work together, I think it's important to understand the details of this matter. I'm, I'm kind of brought back to my own graduate student days when I was um, um, when I was uh, um, there was the you know these like self checkout uh, stations like you can see on the left or you know now we see them everywhere in McDonald's these like self ordering stations. And I uh, came back from the lab one, one night after midnight. I went to the supermarket next to my home. And I really just wanted to get something to eat and go to sleep. And so there was a large line on the only cashier that was there. And all the self-checkout stations were shut down. And then when I finally got to the cashier, um, and this was kind of like a really a waking up moment for me. When I finally got to the cashier, um, I, I was angry and I told him, you know, I don't understand, like, what, what's the point of having the, the like, self-checkout here when in the end they don't work? And especially now when it's only one line. And he said, the self-checkouts, the self -checkouts, they don't work after midnight. I said, what? Why? The whole point is that they're, you know, they're always on, you know, this is the idea of technology, of robotics, it's always on, it's always available. Like, why would they not work after midnight? And then he looked at me and he said, so that I will keep my job. And that's the first time, I, I, like as a robotic student, a graduate student, I never thought about this, this point at the time. I was like, yeah, this is, I only think about this question of like, can this be made more efficient? But this, um, this supermarket actually decided to not use these self-checkouts and they sort of made this value-based decision that they will not use these self-checkouts at night because they want to keep this idea of like the night shift um, workers that they were employing. And I think we'll see more and more places where robots and, and, and humans work side by side. And even then, if that happens, we need to think about like how exactly do they work side by side? And, and I want to share um, some insights we had from a research we did recently in our lab. This was published last year. And then the second part of this research is going is, has just been submitted uh, this week. So it's not out yet, but I'll tell, I can tell you about the, the results um, sort of informally. But this is a research we did last year where we, we collaborated with an econ with a, with a economics professor, Ori Hafetz. And um, we were looking at um, what happens when humans have to compete with the robot for money. So this is actually the first research in HRI where it's not just, you know, the people are not just doing some work with or next to robot, but they actually, they can make more money if the robot um, is not as good as they are and they would lose money if the robot is better than they are. And we, we showed them um, that, uh, I think this is a little bit more obvious, that uh, people um, did not like the robot if it was fast. So here on the right, you see a graph. You know, this is how fast the robot is, how well the robot is doing on, on, the, on the task. Left is the robot is slow. Right is the robot is fast. You can see that this graph shows how much people like the robot and the, the faster the robot is, the less people like the robot. But more interestingly, people also made less of an effort to work when the robot was faster. So if, if, the, the, if somehow the robots increased work, uh, made them not want to work as much, even though they would get the same amount of, of money for each part of work, no matter what the robot did. But just the fact that they were less successful than the robot demotivated them from working. And uh, another, I would say, sort of tragic outcome of this is the graph on the right, which is when we ask people, how good are you at this job? And this is kind of like a very boring and not so easy job that we had people do there. And people, when the robot was not so great, people thought they were better at the job. So they, in some sense, compared themselves to the robot. We didn't ask them how much better than the robot were you because the job was always the same. But people's self-appreciation of their quality was dependent on the robot. And I think this is a really interesting uh, point to remember. If we put people and robots in the same workplace, this will affect 
how they see themselves as workers and how much maybe effort they want to put out. We then re we repeated this experiment this year where we had the robot be a collaborator of the human. So the better the robot worked, the more money people would get. And just changing this incentive structure actually re reversed, or in many cases, almost reversed or reversed completely these effects and people were more motivated to work and did not feel, even though the world was still better than them, did not feel like they were worse at the job. So even if you know you have to put a robot in a certain work situation, you really have to think, this study of ours really shows that you have to think about how, you, how do you structure the motivation and the incentive structures within the company or within the workplace to make, um, um, to achieve the, the outcomes that you would like. So we talked so far about cases where robots are slowly taking over. Um, and I claim that, you know, from a technology and, and economic perspective, there's not much we can do, but, but we do need to think about how incentives are structured in the workplace. But the, this brings us to another question. Are there any um, jobs that can just never be replaced? Like, are there any things that we can't have robots ever do? And this is the question that people have looked at called the automatability of jobs. Um, there was uh, interesting research uh, from uh, Leila, Leila Takayama and Wendy Ju, um, uh, sort of in the late 2000s and zeros and 2010s, uh, early 2010s. And they interviewed a lot of people about what people think robots should do in their jobs. Um, and they found that people, uh, generally public opinion favors robots that, uh, that do um, repetitive tasks that require memory and they prefer humans for jobs that are uh, that require more evaluation judgment maybe social skills diplomacy uh, but experts the second paper on the right is experts uh, asking experts the same questions and experts robotics experts were actually very different had very different opinions they thought that robots should be cre thinking creatively they should be managing people as bosses they should guide and direct people um, Otto Lever and Murnane have proposed this uh, idea of uh, the, it's called the ALM model, uh, based after the authors, and they were looking at, at, at um, what robots can and cannot do, and they had these like two-dimensional structure where they said, you know, the more routine a job is, the more uh, robots can do this, and the more different it is every time, the more robots will not be able to do this. And similarly for physical, you know, which is more robotic job, and cognitive, which is more of a, a human job. Um, and in, in more recent studies, uh, so this is uh, almost 17 years ago, so in more recent studies, people have, have thought that the, the biggest bottlenecks are really this idea of, uh, of social intelligence, creative intelligence, uh, but also of, uh, of perception. So this brings me to sort of like the last frontier of robotics um, and also the place where a lot of human work is, uh, is focused increasingly as automation is taking over a lot of the physical and repetitive sides of, of jobs. Um, and this is uh, jobs that, that are creative, um, that include decision-making. And in some sense, because they, the creative and decision-making jobs require us to have specific preferences and specific values embedded in them, maybe these are jobs that, that uh, robots can never do. But in, our, in, in one of the research projects, the larger research projects in my lab right now, we're actually looking if robots can't do this job, can robots still help a person do the job? And the reason why we think this could be a good place to, to, um, to use robotics without, um, while still keeping the human's advantage is because um, there's an interesting sort of puzzle match between, um, between humans and robots. So humans are very good at big picture thinking, high level thinking, intuition, these things that robots are really not very good at. Um, but humans are not good at understanding large, you know, uh, sets of numbers and um, searching methodically. So, uh, so we've been trying to work for quite a few years now on, on this problem of, uh, of uh, humans and robots collaborating in, uh, in creative and decision-making spaces. And without going into too much detail about, about because we're almost out of time here, I want to show you some, some results that we had from this. So here you can see a result on a very complicated design problem um, where people are trying to optimize a, a, a design problem. And, and again, it has to do with a, a complicated satellite design uh, task. 
And we try to, to look at the state-of-the-art AI that's trying to solve this problem. And here on this graph that you see right now, what, you, what people are trying to do, what the designers are trying to do is to try to get solutions that are more to the right, which means that the, the satellite design has a higher science benefit, and lower, which means that the satellite is cheaper. So this is our cost-benefit graph for this design problem. And we can see that AI searches very broadly. Um, this is the blue um, cloud here. When people try to solve this problem, they solve, they try to solve it very narrowly and they have like a very clear trade-off. You know, the more expensive, um, the more expensive um, uh, solutions have more benefit, but they also, um, they don't find some of the solutions that they, AI can find, which has, you know, the same benefit, but it's cheaper. But when we put humans and AI teams together um, in trying to solve these same problems, we find that they, they um, they can find better designs. And actually, you can see here the outcome of one of our experiments, where when the human and the AI collaborate, they find designs that are significantly cheaper and better than any of these couldn't find on their own. And they find these within minutes, whereas you know, both AI and the humans have to look for hours for these, for these better designs. The way that we studied this is, is we have this you know, setup where people can have a, a physical space that um, that where they can try out their designs. And then we have a robot that uh, can inter intervene and interfere with them and say, you know, okay, maybe we can, you know, in this case, the robot is taking a component from the design and moves it into a different place in the overall design. And we did a, a really interesting study that came out last year uh, or this year, last year, um, where we saw like some of the biggest challenges that, that appear in this type of uh, collaboration. And one of them is that people are very different in the way that they, did, that they design and solve complex decision-making problems. Some are sort of top-down comprehensive thinkers. Some just, you know, they have a plan and they want to move with a the plan. They want to think about every step and they're very slow in the way that they think. Others, for example, they like to just like, tinker and try out many different things. And the robot, if the robot is not aware of the, of the style of thinking and designing of the person, they seem to be more like interfering and, uh, and disruptive to the process. Um, also, we saw that some people think the robot is the expert and they just want to help the robot or make the robot move faster. Whereas other think that others think the robot is there to serve them and, and, and they have the ideas and the robot should just help them you know, polish their ideas. And so if you're interested, you know, I recommend you to look at this paper from, from DIS last year. And which really looks at, at you know, when we put humans and robots together in these creative and decision-making problems, what are the social dynamics that come out of this? The result of this, um, I'm gonna uh, try and end in, in a couple of minutes. Um, the, the result of this was that we, we started to work on these you know, models uh, that describe how people you know, use their intentions and beliefs to come up with design solutions and how they evaluate them and how a robot could fit in, in there. And uh, in, in, a, in a paper that just came out last month, we were looking at the problem of designing voting districts, which is a big political problem in the US. And there's a lot of questions of what a fair voting district is. And we found that we were able to, to have a, uh, an AI system just look at what a person is doing on the map. And then from that, understand what their definition of fairness is. And then they can suggest solutions that are in line with the fairness values of the designer, of the problem solver, of the decision maker. And one of the biggest challenges here is that it's very hard to get data for machine learning algorithms. So we don't have, you, you can't get a lot of data that's consistent because the problems of, the, uh, of design are usually always a little bit different. So if you wanna help somebody design a new railway, railway line, um, it's very different from any previous example of designing railway lines. So it's not like image processing where the, the examples are usually very similar. So just to summarize um, what we've learned from our recent work on, on human AI design, is the first study really shows that uh, under some, under some like, conditions, human AI teams can find better designs than just humans or just AI. The second study is that, you know, when making decisions, people have very different goals and styles and, and the, the robot needs to be aware of these goals and styles. Uh, and the third one is that we were able to show that we can infer some of these preferences and goals um, and uh, values of the humans just from looking at how they move through the design process. So I'm going back to, to my original question, will robots take your job? Um, I would say that it's 
you know, technologically and economically, the question, the answer is, I'm just, sorry, one more. Um, technologically and, uh, and uh, economically, the, the answer to this will increasingly be yes, but we should, we should uh, insist to make this question a question of values. Um, I think robots at work will uh, become increasingly better um, and they will be able to do more and more jobs and you know think about the Amazon grasping challenge uh, but we need have to set we have to use our values to set the incentive structures and the, uh, the labor laws and the, the um, compensation structures to make this work for the society as a whole I think robots um, at home are much more behind I think we haven't been able to find a good use case for robots. Um, and when we look at, at the biggest use cases like robots for the elder population or robots for children, we really have to make sure that our values come first and the technology will follow our values. And I'm not very optimistic about this, honestly, because when we look at the latest technological changes, uh, we saw that, the, you know, when I'm talking about smartphones, we saw that, you know, values slipped behind and a lot of, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the times technology kind of led. Um, so we need to really not make the same mistake we did with smartphone technology, but we need to, we need to uh, think ahead of the technological change, which we're still at this point, and this is sort of like a, a moment in time that we need to make use of before it's, it's too late and, and the other pressures are, are driving solutions. So the lesson here is, I, don't, I think we shouldn't wait for it to happen and then think what we think about it. We need to decide now what we want how we want robots to, in, to come into our home. And then at work, the best thing we should think about is what is our, our human competitive advantage and how we can, can we make use of that? So in public spaces, I think robots will be increasingly uh, there. You know, um, uh, It's a natural place for robots to, to appear at home. I think we need to be careful and intentional now before we have robots in our home. And work, when you think about our competitive advantage, when you think about the overall ecosystem of, uh, of uh, robotics, when you think about uh, making decisions based on the values they want to promote. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions and open anything for discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Kamani has her hand raised. Why don't you go ahead? I guess I'm always the first one to raise my hand. I'm sorry about that. Um, a few comments uh, uh, and and uh, and a couple of questions. Uh, one is that uh, is it in a process and so much in line with. Uh, of what you've been speaking about and so it's very interesting for us to know our actually our mission is very very close to what you had put up as your mission except that we also have the environment uh very much in with with humans uh, we also have to have no matter what you always have to take the environment into consideration that is something uh that we we feel has to be spelled out very clearly just like you spell out values uh you have to, that has to include the natural environment um, not just the human built environment and that's that's about the only thing and that was a comment um uh that i wanted to say and then i'm just going through your talk as as you gave it the second is about the uncanny valley and uh, i remember the first time i think i encountered the uncanny valley was at polar express and why it flopped so miserably i hated the movie too um but uh, but one of the reasons in animation that they say is they tried not to make things too human-like or too close to reality and then you don't have to worry about the uncanny valley and maybe that's the same thing that should be there for robots also like we always liked r2d2 better than we like uh, like whatever his name was um but but i think that there is this obsession to make robots so close to humans and, and there is actually really no need for that and if you make them functional and you don't make them so human like i think we could just completely avoid the uncanny valley but not just in physical shape and, and function, but also in terms of intelligence, I feel. There may be an uncanny valley that's also associated with robotic intelligence. Maybe we don't make them as close to human intelligence, um, or they shouldn't get the sense that they're thinking like humans, maybe. And maybe we can avoid an uncanny valley in terms of that. 
comfort uh, that you have with them. They can think like machines and it should be fine. They don't have to think like humans. Um, that was one thing that I thought of. Um, the third thing that I was thinking that this is the one that we've mulled over for so many years because we're working in the vocational space, right? So we're talking about people um, who are not in the tertiary education who are in the vocational spaces. You're talking about hard labor and you're talking about automation and robotics really taking up a lot of jobs. Uh, I remember the first time we really encountered this, like really it was hit, it hit us in our face was uh, in, uh, in I think 2012, we went, we visited a cement factory and they had <clears throat> some 40,000 employees. It's a ridiculous number. It's one of the largest cement factories in India and they were going to lay off most of their workforce uh, because they were bringing in automation. And you were talking about people who were like, 40 years old, 50 years old, and they came in uh, to these companies, these uh, these factories, just as manual labor. They would break stones and, and carry things from one place to another. And now they were 50, they were old. Uh, they didn't, they could not reskill these people. Uh, they didn't have uh, any way to retrain them. And they're physically also, they're not well because they were doing so much hard work all these years. And they had a huge HR problem and what are they going to do when they lay off this many people, when they bring in automation? And that's the time when we really started. You have to bring in automation for certain kinds of things and robotics for certain kinds, but then what would you do with people? And then for a long time, we had discussions in the lab on how, when we would design things, how would we want to do it so that we always keep the humans in the loop there? Because we never started from the robotics and we always started from the human side. So we've always approached the problem as solving something that was a problem at the ground level. So that was the guiding person. So I remember um, many of the discussions that we had and we thought it's, it's obvious that automation and robotics is going to come in in such a big way, but maybe humans can co-own uh, automation, large automation. So for example, um, if you're going to replace 10 workers or 20 workers with with uh, with one robot can the 20 workers own this one robot as opposed to the industry owning that one robot so uh, going back to the research that you just uh, talked about where the robot makes money for the person but not as any one individual because that would never make any economic sense and no matter what we say economic is probably is is the largest driver of anything so you're never going to be able to take it out of the equation so it will be in the equation but the question is can the economics not help the industry but can it help the people and and protect uh, the people so if that large robot can be somehow co-owned by a group of people and it, it brings money for it's not like trade unions but in in some other way it's technology unions if you created something like that and maybe that would be a solution i mean these are thoughts that we had we never really worked on the social sciences aspect of it so much um but i just thought we'd just share with you some of the ideas that we were thinking about in in those areas and um yeah, no, those are my only comments. I have other comments, but I can write write that to you on an email later. Maybe that's just, it's just a high level comments that I wanted to share. Yeah, I think I think that last point especially is um, um, we've been trying to get a sort of a government grant to try to research these new economic structures for for uh, robotics, including, you know, co-owning this by the workers or renting, leasing robots and, and trying to sort of redefine um, how, uh, how people who are, um, so like, I, I like the way you, you frame it, like, like vocational workers who don't have a tertiary education. Um, and I think there's a, a huge opportunity here. This opportunity has, has to be sort of co-designed by, uh, by economists, um, roboticists, and you know, government, um, and this will not, you know, if we just let, leave this to the technology companies, I don't think we will get the right solution. So I, I, I'm very happy to keep thinking about this type of uh, this type of question. See the other people, Soren. Um, Gayatri. Gayatri, yes. Uh, Okay, so you want to go? Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It was uh, really very interesting. Um, 
I have a slightly, uh, you know, on a topic that uh, you really touched very little uh, in this talk that is more about robotics for public spaces. Um, currently, um, I am working uh, with two students, master students, on uh, trying to create a robot for encouraging hand washing behavior. So it is more like situated in a, in a space like a school. Uh, where you're motivating children. So it's not really a personal robot, but something in, in you know, that is uh, in a public space uh, and uh, can interact with multiple uh, children. One thing I see is that, you know, when you're doing such HRI in the wild studies, um, there are so many factors, so many unseen factors that one needs to control. And a lot of the HRI studies that I see and I read literature about, or in a laboratory setting, in a very controlled sort of environment. Uh, do you have any recommendations that, you know, some researchers like me who are working on more general things, how we could generalize the knowledge that uh, we have from the lab studies into, you know, real world situations like what we are attempting to do? Um, and the other thing, uh, the second question I would also have is, um, if you could share some insights on some of the ethical considerations that we must take into account uh, when we build such persuasive technologies uh, for things like behavioral changes, uh, even though the intention is good, you know, we can never predict the fallout of what happens with such technologies. So if you could uh, share some, um, some uh, from your experience, some insights that we could make sure we build in as we build these technologies. So first of all, um, I, I think that the solution for the you know, first question is really is just to make sure that we encourage and, and, um, and sort of reward more real world deployment studies. And um, and you know perhaps within the, the academic community have you know special tracks that are just for uh, studies that are done in in real environment. I think there's just not enough of these, and, and because it's so hard. But there's a few that have now started, uh, and and again including you know the work you did you you've been doing with the hand washing uh, robots. So um, I think. Researchers just need to acknowledge that the, how much more difficult it is to deploy a system anywhere outside of the lab, and but it's also extremely necessary. And the second uh, part, I think that's really, I think I'm, I'm pretty encouraged about this because I, I believe that the, the question of the of the societal um, societal cost uh, or benefit of any technology is now being uh, um, evaluated much more uh, consistently. Um, in our lab, we've, we've been trying to have a habit to start uh, adding like a societal impact section to all of our technology uh, focused papers. And, and I think this is mostly to do with education. I think we need to make sure that our engineering education includes uh, ethical and societal uh, components. And I think it should be done in a way that's not just um, as lip service, but also, you know, really encourage a more interdisciplinary education for en engineers. Um, I think that's that's where the, the core is. I think I also saw that Tetsur is raising his hand. Yeah, uh, if anybody, can I? I don't know. Okay. Sure. All right. Uh, Guy, thanks for the fascinating talk. Uh, and sharing with us uh, latest uh, uh, discoveries and uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I have so many questions that I'm trying to pick. Uh, so I'll pick one that is actually out of my uh, comfort zone. Uh, um, so I was wondering whether you see any way of uh, using some sort of robots to uh, enhance woman empowerment. Um, is that anything that you can uh, try to speculate? Because as a Western person, uh, what comes to mind is very, di um, very different from uh, maybe 
somebody that protects the women in the villages, um, some sort of an assistant that I, I have no idea. Do you see any, any ideas on that direction? Um, so it's, it's, it's not something that I've been working on, so I don't have a lot of um, academic insight in, in this, into this. I, I think the, the way to approach this is really to, to um, I, I, I'll just mention that I heard you uh, in one, one of the talks I can remember a few years ago, uh, talking about not, too, not enough uh, women in robotics in general. But uh, that's on a different. So I know that you're, yeah, very much into the idea of uh, empowering women. No, I definitely, you know, I, I think there's. Um, so again, there's been a, a very large shift globally in the last few years um, around this. So if you look at the last, especially I would say the last five years, but but I want to talk specific. So obviously, I think we need to make sure, you know, and and. and Everybody in their own space um, needs to make sure that we have uh, equitable access to to education and to um, to opportunities. And you know, when, when I just an example, I started at uh, at Cornell um, and I started my class. I, I needed to recruit teaching assistants for my uh, mechanical design class, and the first year only male students applied for the job. Um, which I thought was very strange because actually in our department we have 35% uh, female students, um, and and on, only when I when I sort of insisted with the department that we that we will not start the class until we have at least 40%, you know, so like an equitable um, proportional amount of, of, of women TAs, um, that we just found that a lot of a lot of the female students did not apply for the job because they thought because Historically, the TAs in this class were always male students, and they didn't think that this was, you know, the, the, there was a, a point to apply. But since then, um, I've consistently had over fifty percent female TAs uh, without having to sort of pressure the department to do this. So this is sort of on, on, I think, in everybody in their own, in their own sort of circle, you can, you know, look at what you for change you wanna, you wanna maybe make. I think when we talk about robotic technology. Um, with this in mind, I think really this kind of design needs to be driven by, you know, in this case, you know, women researchers, uh, women robotics designers, and I think the the right way to do this is to involve the population we want to um, we want to um, be, in, be interacting with this technology in the design process from the beginning, uh, and not try to you know imagine what what we would think is the right solution. So this is goes back to the, to the principles of uh, sort of participatory design and, and co-design, um, and I think this would be the, the approach that I would I would encourage um, rather than suggesting a, a specific solution. Uh, thanks very much. Very uh, very uh, thought provoking, and uh, I take uh, your words. Uh, I will leave others. If uh, if not, I have many other questions but um, hello this is Sophia I'm a faculty here at the Master of Social Work program and a researcher for the Center of Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality I was wondering if, if there have actually been research study on how the interaction with social robots decreases the feelings of loneliness or does it actually increase the feelings of loneliness I think so. I, I think that's a great question. I, I don't. I don't have um, off the top of my head any data on this. I, I think generally, I'll, I'll give you my more general question answer. I, I think if um, if people are studying or, or developing a robot that's supposed to decrease loneliness, I'm sure that when they publish the paper, the results are supporting their their goals. But I'm not sure if I completely will trust these results. And I, I think that that type of um, research is actually very interesting. So I, I don't have an answer for this because I don't have 
a specific example in mind, but I, I actually really love this question. I, and my guess is that um, this, it's a much more mixed bag than the researchers would probably uh, suggest. Again, sorry that I don't have any data for you off the top of my head. Yeah, maybe more research studies will be coming in the future. Yeah. Does anybody else have questions? Um, I kind of tied into I, what you go ahead. No, I only if nobody has anything to say, then I'll add something. But please go ahead first. Um, T tied into what you were saying about how education, remote education, isn't the, the, the answer that, that was envisioned for all this time, and also tied into your answer to Zora's question about um, increasing access to education and equitable like involvement in, um, in the co-creation process and, and, and things like that. Is there anything that you could envision or you have heard of that could potentially, involving robots, um, move things more in the direction of equitable access to education? Um, I don't know if my question is making sense. But I'm trying to like like this, the distance learning thing or the the remote learning. I, I understand it's not it's not the it's not the solution necessarily. But it is something that could be done to improve equitable access. Is there some way that you can imagine robots becoming more uh, more of a help than than or for that kind of education? Um, so when you say equitable access, you mean access, access to what, what, what types of populations do you have in mind when you think, when you think? So I, I'm kind of more thinking along the lines of like rural populations in developing countries like, like in India, where there are not, uh, necessarily consistent school facilities or not necessarily high quality school facilities all the time. Um, and there's, I mean, I know that there are many, many other factors that are involved in the education process, including like making, like making sure that families themselves value edu education. But if it were like easily accessible, maybe I don't know. My, my question. No, I, I, to I think well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a great question, and I'm, I'm a little hesitant because it's really not. A, I don't have expertise in this, so I don't want to just speculate um, ab around this. I, I, I know that in, in many cases you have sort of the idea that you know technology will solve something that is really an underlying structural problem that has to do with the priorities and the political priorities of, of a certain um, you know state um, and. And often, like what happens, you say, "Oh, yeah, we have this, you know, software. We have this robot. We have this, you know, kit that will, you know, will help students." And I can sort of talk. I don't want to talk about an area that I don't know. But if we think about Israel, where I'm from, you have, you know, you have like this strong socioeconomic central city of Tel Aviv in the area, and then you have a much more socioeconomic weaker. Um, rural areas and there's no real rural areas in Israel because it's very small but you have sort of the, the desert and, um, um, and I think the we, we need to be careful to, to think about technology as being the, the right answer to this as a general solution uh, and, and I think uh, in places where it's very difficult to make a brave or um, complicated political and social decisions, uh, policymakers and government 
often will say, oh, we have this you know, very shiny new technology that we can, that we can just use instead of having to solve this problem. And, and as a, as a follow-up, then you, you want to make sure that the problem is actually solved. But I think in many cases, it's just a way to spend less effort uh, in solving the actual problem that leads to, to these, uh, um, these differences. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, so again, I will go back to what I've been saying the whole lecture. What I've been trying to say is that oh, yes. we need to think about, about politics. We need to think about social relationships. We need to think about values, um, and then the technology should support these. And we shouldn't be sort of blinded by the technology as being a solution. Um, but uh, I think the narrative structure should be should be reversed. So yeah, and that starts at educational institutions, right? And if the way that we encourage, sorry, I'm jumping in just because it's the same conversation, but uh, it's it's so important uh, that this happens at the educational institutions uh, because you're you're encouraging innovation on one side, you're encouraging people to take up technology and then basically make companies, and there's this huge push by all educational institutions for maybe stu basically students to go run wild and make the most money out of it. So if, if while teaching it that for every class that is there, if that value component is not added into every class, or into every course, uh, there's no way we can actually accomplish this. Yeah, agreed. Hey, Guy, I have a question. Um, so I was wondering, when you're talking about values, I was wondering what the values are that you're speaking about and whose values and who decides if, if somebody decides. And we all know that uh, in anybody's country, it's a composite of various groups with various under, understandings about the world and what's important to them and what's less important. and there's no homogeneity, homogeneity. So, yeah. Adia Salva, and this has been around for, in the West, about 2,500 years, when the ancient Greek philosophers talked about, about values and ethics. And in India, every time I say something like that, Bhavani tells me, oh, in India, we thought about that 500 years earlier. So they've been thinking about it maybe. <laughs> Ooh. Maybe 3,000, 4,000 years. <laughs> um, so you know, it's really a pretty naughty uh, uh, issue, the questions I ask. So I'd, I'd really be happy to hear what is, you think about it. Yeah, uh, so I, I see that Gayatri has her hand up. I don't know if that's in response to what you were saying or something else. No, actually, uh, just to add on to it, I actually want to know if there is a group of researchers, you know, group of uh, uh, robotists and social science uh, researchers who are actually looking at it from uh, value-based uh, development. You know, if, if we want to build momentum and we want to see this in action, is there any forum or is there anything where we could leverage upon or exchange ideas and how, how we could incorporate? Because we, we, we are trying to bring this into what we are trying to do. Um, but uh, as I said, often we try to do real life, uh, real life situation studies because, uh, you know, looking at laboratory setting doesn't ne necessarily give us the societal impact that we are going for. And then so many things change. And then, you know, it becomes such a complicated and a messy thing. So it'll be good if we have like a, like a cohort of researchers working on it so that we, we could, you know, actually learn from each other and build momentum on it. So that's... Yeah, I mean, I don't know if any, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's uh, um, different organizations, but I don't, I don't have these, you know, off the, off the top of my head, but I, but I think First of all, it would be good to have such a forum where people could bring their research and, and sort of evaluate these according to these values. But also to what Sydney was asking, there's no like one size fits all, you know, 
what value solution. I think the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that these things are messy. You know, people have to live together. They have to make sense of their lives. They have to try to improve their, their own and other people's lives. And this uh, political struggle has been going on for, you know, let's say 5,000 years all around the world, wherever people are living together. Um, and we shouldn't hope that a technological solution will somehow solve this problem, you know, and I think we can, if you look at something like social media, we've seen that trying to solve the problem of connecting people to information to each other, you know, immediately raises other problems. And we go back to this question of like, what do we want to achieve? And I'm just saying that we're going to have to have this conversation and political struggles uh, into the future unrelated to what technology we have to solve. So technology has to be one part of this. It shouldn't be thought of as, as something that can overcome these problems. I have to say this is a very thought provoking uh, uh, when you're saying that um, we're looking through the prism of we, how do we build a robot that solves such and such a social problem, whereas you are trying to advocate, um, let's try to solve the problem itself, not necessarily using robotics or technology. And in many cases you hint, I suggest that you may hint that over usage of technologies to solve social problems uh, seems to be uh, or overused or some of that. I, I just think we should think about the development of technology as being part of the puzzle and not as being instead of having to solve the puzzle. Well, isn't it? I mean, it's quite costly to build these robots, isn't it? It's not a like a simple and a cheap thing. So get in the lab and start building a robot for complex tasks. So if you're, and I think, um, Guy, you mentioned that there were, you mentioned funding on your part, and also the companies like Amazon, they're funding um, research for their own purposes. So this is a costly technology that requires some money and no one really, unless it's someone like Ma or people with very humanitarian objectives, are going to build these things for um, to help poor people and not get any money back from it. When, as you're saying, these are really social problems that the government can address in different ways instead of applying a costly technolo technological approach to something that just requires some other sort of government attention. So on that note, um, are there funders out there that you're aware of that are doing the um, sort of humanitarian-based robotic fundings that we can look at? That um, Are there any suggestions you have in that regard? So can I, I don't know of any organizations that do this, um, but just speaking about the cost of, of, of these, I, I think the you know, these companies, they don't operate in a vacuum, they operate within a, a societal and governmental system. And, uh, and I think these are the types of conversations you have on the political level when you have companies that want to introduce technology that they never, I mean, they always work within a system where they are benefiting from, you know, the infrastructure and the education that, they, you know, a certain country provides. And so therefore, I think this, it's always an interconnected network of interests and, and, and of uh, money. Um, and it's not just that, uh, you know, we, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of the companies have their, uh, like you have, they have their like nonprofit supporting organizations. Um, and these could be, uh, I mean, I don't, again, I haven't thought about this in this perspective, but I know that Google has their like google.org arm and i think other com other large technology companies that also have um also have uh, their like non-profit uh, general um sort of societal benefit branches and i think this could be good places to start looking at yes thank you All right.
right? So I really love the discussion that came up here. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. We have to thank you. It was um, really so, so wonderful. So close to our hearts. Uh, and just it gave, gives us uh, added uh, um, enthusiasm to continue what we're doing. Please, the honor was completely ours. Very grateful for your time. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. So that's about. And I, I've sent you some uh, messages on on the Zoom chat, which is directed only to you. So yes, if you have time, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Since these disappeared, you can also send me over email. It would be yes, I can I will. Respond I will. To this because once this is closed, I won't have access to the messages anymore. Yes, and any other follow up, if you want to send me an email, anybody here in the audience, feel free. And I hope you have a great thank rest you. of the year and that next year will be easier for everybody. We hope. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, thank you very much. Bemet, for that, for that. Bye bye. Thank you so much. It was just awesome. Thank you. Thank you.